Mark chapter 11, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. And this is written in red, so it's not up for debate. The Bible is not up for debate. It's not up for vote. It's not up for a business meeting. It's already been established. Watch this, Mark chapter 11, if you're there, say amen. We're going to go to verse 22 through 24. This is the third part in my series, your open window, your, your window of opportunity. And today's window is called the window of faith. Everybody say the window of faith. The window of faith, Mark 11, verse 22 through 24. And Jesus answering saith unto them. See, before this, they was talking about the dry roots and this, that, and the other, and all kinds of things and uh, about faith. And God says, here's my answer I give to you today. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever, how many of y'all are a whosoever? That's everybody in here today. You are a whosoever. It says, for whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea and shall not what? And shall not what? Doubt in his heart but shall believe that those things which he had said shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever, whatsoever, in case you didn't hear it, whatsoever he saith. Verse 24, therefore, anytime you see a therefore in the Bible, you need to know why it's therefore, amen? Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire. God even goes the next step. He says, man, listen to me. If you believe it big enough, if you believe it with all your heart, and you're not wishy-washy, because here's, here's Christian's favorite prayer. Y'all ready? Lord, I wrote this down. I know you can, but. Lord, I know you can, but. How many of y'all ever had that prayer? Lord, I know you can move a mountain, but. Lord, I know you can heal sickness, but. Lord, I know you can, you can uh, fill your house, but. We always have a bud at the end of the sentence. Watch this. In verse 24, he said these words. And if you believe it, whatever you desire, when you pray, believe. Watch this. Here's the key that you've already received it, that you've already received it, that you already received it. Thank you, Lord, I got it. Thank you, Lord, it's here. And you say, Brian, isn't that being cocky? No, that's being faithful. No, that's being faithful. That's saying, God, I trust what you've already put in action. I'm going to say that again. I didn't have it wrote down, but that's good. I trust what is already in motion. I trust what is already in action. All I've got to do now is wait for my blessing to come. See, right now, watch this. God is working on your behalf. And listen to me. You're, you're waiting to see it. You're waiting to feel it. You're waiting to hear it. But can I tell you, faith don't require seeing. Faith don't require hearing. And faith don't require feeling. Because faith is faith. And God is God. Faith requires receiving. Receiving. So see, you can see all you want to. Now watch this. The five senses. We talk about, I was taught in school that we had five senses. Y'all were too, right? You, you was taught that you, your sense of seeing, smelling, tasting, hearing, and feeling. That's your five senses. What if I told you you had a sixth sense? What if I told you there's six instead of five? You say, well, my teacher lied. <laughs> I can see y'all now. You have a six, number six sense. And that sixth sense is called faith. Because see, look. Even though my ear, can't, it, can't, it, don't, it don't tell me that there's a chair there. Now, my sense of seeing tells me there's a chair there. But if I was going to rely upon my hearing, you couldn't convince me that that is a chair right there sitting right there. You couldn't convince me. Now, my eyes can, but my ears can't. But that doesn't tell me that that chair, the truth of the matter is, that chair is sitting there. Faith goes above and beyond your senses. Faith goes above and beyond how you feel, what it looks like, how, well, what you're hearing from others. Faith requires one thing, receiving. Now, I want you all to hear this, preacher. When you got saved, it required faith. You had to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. It requires you receiving what God has already given. Does that, does that make sense to you all? Does it make sense? It's, it's already out there. It's already here, but now, let me teach this for a moment. It's already out there, but what you have to do, your faith requires now you receiving what God has already done. Salvation. He died upon the cross. How do, you, how do you get it? You receive it. It's already been paid for. You've already been bought, but God says now you've got to receive it. That's what faith is. Faith is not a three-point sermon and a benediction, and you go home and pray that it's going to hit you. 
Faith is already just believing what God has already done. That'll preach. Let me go a little bit deeper with you since y'all didn't get that one. Listen to me, Matthew chapter 21 in your Bibles. It talks about, it talks about, about a fig tree. It says one day in, in, in Matthew chapter 21, you can do this later, do it as a Bible study, verses 18 through 22. It says Jesus was hungry. He was walking down the road and he looked to the right and he seen a fig tree. This fig tree, Brother Bob, all it had was leaves. It did not have no fruit. And Jesus did something crazy. Everybody say he did something crazy. He did something so crazy. He looked at the fig tree and he said, you are cursed. He says, you will not bear no more fruit. And the amazing thing was, Brother Keith, the disciples were around and all of a sudden they want to have a business meeting. Well, I didn't see the leaves. That nothing's wrong. The leaves didn't disappear. And I don't see the, the tree withering away. And I didn't see it dried up. And all of a sudden, they wanted to see an instant, an instant, an instant. I'm going to help you. Watch this. They wanted to see the tree wither away. The next day, Jesus Christ showed back up on the same scene. His disciples were still there. They were still debating, was the tree dead or not? And Jesus looks at him and he says these words. I love what Jesus did. He looked at him and he says, you missed it. And this is a paraphrase. You've missed it. He said, the tree was cursed yesterday, but you didn't see it. See, what I'm trying to tell you is God's done spoke something in motion. And we're waiting for a, a, to see it and to hear it and to feel it or to taste his glory. But what I'm trying to tell Elkhorn Baptist Church and you as a guest and you as my friends is what your miracle is already in motion. My God. Your, your healing is already out there. It's already there. But the problem is this. The churches are not taking the Bible at God's word. They're debating. They're debating and they're dialoguing and they're having business meetings. And they're even saying now, did Jesus have a wife? Leonardo da Vinci, who was a painter, not a theologian. He painted that God, that Jesus was married to Mary. And all of a sudden they're believing a painter, Leonardo da Vinci, a painter, an artist, over the Bible. Don't you think if Jesus was married, he would it'd be so important, he would say, hey, I was married. But the world is listening to wrong theology, wrong doctrine, and they're basing their feelings on what they can see. Oh, I'm preaching now. What they can hear, how they feel, if it works out for them, they're in. But I'm going to tell you, I got some good news today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's not about a feeling, an emotion, or a sight. It's already in motion, somebody praising. Your healing's already out there. I know you say, Brian, I, I don't feel it. I'm not worried about your feelings. When you get to heaven, God's not going to look at you and say, hey, Greg, what you think? He's not going to look at us, Don, and say, hey, y'all did as good as y'all could. You will be judged according, according to the dash. Not your sin. Your, watch this, help me. Your sin has already been paid for. I'm preaching now. Your sin has already been paid for. The cross took care of the sin. The cross took care of your cuss word. The cross took care of your blasphemy. But watch this. Now God's sitting and saying, now, Elkhorn, <laughs> what are you doing with that salvation, that dash? When you stand before God, you will stand before God based upon what you did with your salvation while you was alive here on earth. That's why it's important to live for God, hallelujah, while you're alive and you can live for the Lord. That's why it's important to be faithful while you can be faithful. That's why it's important to give God praise, honor, and glory while you've got breath in your lungs and you can stand to your feet and raise your hands and say, blessed be the name. I'm going to praise him anyhow, hallelujah. I'm going to praise him anyhow. Because what I need is already in motion. I want that to get in your spirit this morning. My prayers, Dr. Billy Graham said, prayers have already been answered, but people's not receiving. Prayer, heaven is full of answered prayers, but nobody's receiving. Why? Let me tell you the biggest thing, my biggest blessing I have done in my life. When I became your pastor, this is my heartbeat to you this morning. We was over in that old sanctuary. We was over there, and here's what I could see. I could see chairs already set up over here in this church. I didn't stay over there. I moved from there over to here. And even though we wasn't here yet, I come down this aisle, and I said, God, I can see a chair here. Bless him. Bless him. We rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Bless Renee. 
I started walking around the campus, walking around my Jericho and thanking God for the walls, hallelujah, coming down. Even though I couldn't see it, even though I couldn't feel it, even though I didn't hear it, I could see something in my spirit like never before. And I started thanking God for what he was going to do and what he had already done. And that's why we're here today. And that's why we're going there tomorrow. So here's how you pray. Y'all ready? I'm going to teach you just for a moment. Here's how you pray. You do not have to bombard God every single day over the same old prayer every single day. You do not have to do it. 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 If your children are out partying and doing whatever, here's what you got to do. God, I thank you that my children are coming home. I receive that in Jesus' name. Walk away knowing that God has already done it. Y'all getting this preaching today? That's what you do. We don't sit here and talk about what God did in 1999. We thank God what he's going to do in 2013 because he is God of today. That's faith. That's faith. You've got to have faith prayers, faith believing that what you prayed, it shall come to pass. That when my children are sick, here's what, here's what my prayer is. I lay my hand on them, I anoint them with oil, and I say, God, I thank you for healing my daughter destiny. I don't tell God that she's sick. I tell God what he did on that cross was worth it, and you are healed. Y'all see the faith, faith, faith? Y'all see? Y'all, y'all, y'all get this, right? Faith prayers, faith prayers. Not reminding God of where you're at or who you have been. Thanking God for who you are and where you're going. My God, that'll preach. Where I'm going, who we are. What's happening in my family? What's happening at Elkhorn? I see and I pray and I prophesy today greater works we will see because we're believing in God than what we did yesterday, 1999. I'm not worried about that. I thank God for that. But I'm going forward and believing and calling things, hallelujah, that are not as though they are, and I'm a faith preacher. What about you? You say, Brian, that's a hard prayer. Oh, it is, especially when you walk into a hospital room and somebody's laying there, sick in their bones, and God tells you to go ahead and say they're healed. That's faith. That's faith. When you lay hands on and here's how America is. Well, what if they die? Oh, they're going to die if you pray over them. If I'm sick in my bones and I'm at the hospital, please do not come and pray for me and say, God, I feel sorry for him. Boy, he looks bad. He's got black under his eyes. I know your stomach hurts. Oh, my God. I hope you're okay. Are you all right, Brother Brian? Don't, don't, don't come visit me. I want somebody to walk in that hospital room with the authority of God, with a Bible in their hand, and say, God loves you. You're healed. You're healed. You're healed. Take up your bed and walk. Lay hands upon the sick, and they shall arise. I bind you. I cast you down. I receive my healing, and I'm going to walk it out. Hallelujah. I know some of you look at me and say, Brian, it don't work like that. It don't work like that for you. You know why? Because there's a little doubt. There's a little doubt. If there's a little doubt mixed in with faith, you will not get your prayers answered. I'm telling you, I know I'm. A, this is a crazy sermon. And some of y'all are really looking at me sitting there going, that dude needs to go back on vacation or something. He caught something in Orlando. I'm telling you, there was a survey that went out, Donnie, of 90-year-old people and above. True story, true statement. They said, what's the three things you wish you could do over in your life? Number one, they said, I wish I had a love more than I love. Number two, of 90 years of age of people and above. Number two, I wish I had forgiven people like God told me to. And number three, I wish I'd have took more risk. I wish, looking over my life, I would have loved more. I would have forgave more, and I would have took more risk in my life. I refused to die an old man wrinkled and go before the Lord. And God said, Brian, you could have had this if you would have believed me like I said in the Bible. I'm going to go to heaven with a shout. I don't care who rises up against me because I'm telling you, God and me make the majority. And if God be for me, see, we know the Bible. But the Bible has to become a reality to you. The Bible has to quit. You've got to quit reading it as a storybook or a nighttime lesson. And you've got to say, God, this is what you said, and I receive it in Jesus' name. 
get in trouble for preaching like this. So see, what I'm trying to tell you is a lot of you have been praying and praying and praying and reminding God what you don't have. I'm sitting and telling you today, I feel the unction of the Holy Ghost, that you need to pray and thank God for what you do have. Where you're going, what you got, and where you're going to be going. That's a faith prayer. That's a faith prayer. Do you think God died on the cross for you to be busted, broken, and disgusted? Do you really think God died on the cross for you to be depressed? No. But when I preach like this, I get more stinking emails because you say, well, Brian, that's not like what it is in my life. I'm sitting and telling you today, I stick with the Word. The Word. And I, the biggest lesson I've ever learned in my life, is I quit reminding God that he died on the, Christ, on the cross, and I tell God, thank you for the resurrection of the grave. When you start acting like that, and you start believing like that, Greg, dead things come to life, hallelujah. You'll walk on water, hallelujah. You say, Brian, you don't understand where my daughter, my son, my husband's at right now. You don't understand. Pray like this. God, I thank you that my husband's going to be born again. I thank you that my wife's going to get so on fire and so hot by the Holy Ghost. She's going to come in with smoke coming out her ears. Hallelujah. What I'm trying to tell you guys today is this. In Matthew chapter 8 and in John chapter 2. Matthew chapter 8 talks about the lepers. Really quick, when I had leprosy come to God, he said, Lord, if you will, will you heal me? And God's like, if I will, you're already healed. Yeah, I love that. If I will, are you joking? If I will, you're already healed. And I love what he said next. He said, now go show yourself to the priest. Here's why he done that. Because as he went, see, he was already healed in Matthew chapter 8 when God said that you're healed. He's already healed. It just hadn't manifested yet, Sheila. I know I'm preaching to somebody here today. As you go, the faith will come. My God. As you walk, as you go, the faith will come, Mary. Come on, I feel it in my bones for you today, girl. As you go, in John chapter 2, the first miracle that Jesus did was turn the water into wine. Yes, it was wine. Shh, don't tell nobody. It's just in the Bible. Yes, it was wine. Yes, it was wine. It was not grape juice. It was wine. People want to debate that. you got churches splitting today. Was it grape juice or was it wine? If you would read your Bible, you would know it was wine. If you really get deep, God says, I saved the best for last. Oh, uh, I won't go to another sermon. We'll do it next month. So what I'm trying to tell you, as you go, your faith will come. As I go toward God, my faith will come. As Peter got out of the boat... And went and walked, he walked on water. Y'all see what I'm saying? See, a lot of you abort your miracles and your promises in your window of opportunity because it didn't happen instantly. But what I'm trying to tell you today, if you're listening to this preacher, it's already out there. But as you go and as you thank him, the more faith will come in your life. Now, people will look at you like you're crazy and they'll sit and say you're crazy. But here's what I know. I think here's what I personally think is what's wrong with Christians today. We've been in the safe zone for way too long. Let me explain this. Everybody say safe zone. So if this sermon today is strange to you or it's bothering you, you're in the safe zone. You're in the safe zone. Here's what the safe zone is. They never take risk. They never take risk. If you never fail at anything, you know what that tells me? <laughs> you never try anything. If you never fail at anything, it's because you never try anything. Now, all churches want to do today is be comfortable. Now, not Elkhorn. If you're comfortable, something's wrong with you right now. I hope and pray this place becomes so discomfortable you'll do something. I hope it becomes so discomfortable you'll do something. I hope and pray. See, I, you got a preacher in front of you just thinks it's normal to see salvation every Sunday, every Monday, every Tuesday. You got a pastor in front of you that believes that you should lay hands upon the sick and they shall arise. You believe that you, I, you got a pastor in front of you that believes from Genesis to Revelation. I believe it all and I don't vote none of it out. So if it makes you very uncomfortable, good. Good. Here's the, the safe zone people just sit back and they criticize everybody else who tries. 
And the safe zone people will also tell others why you can't do it. Instead of sitting there going, this is why we can do it, and I'll help you do it, they'll sit back and say, you can't do it, and here's the reason why, but they'll never get out and walk on water with you, Donna. Y'all know I'm preaching truth, don't you? Y'all know I'm Because y'all been in churches like that before. Oh, give us souls, give us souls, blessed be the name, give us souls. And all of a sudden, black people start getting saved, and white people start getting saved, and Japanese and Chinese and everything else in between. And here's, here's the first thing. Well, we don't know what to do with them people. It's the truth. We had, this, is, this is the first business meeting, one of the first. We had, this is one of the first business meetings I had at a Baptist church. Y'all ready? There was a white and black couple moved down the road about five miles from the church. Interracial couple. You say, Brian, is that okay with you? It's okay with me. Moses married the poor. She was Ethiopian. He was a Jew. One day my daughter, who is Chinese, is going to probably marry a white man or a black man. I don't know, maybe Asian, Japanese, I don't know. As long as he loves the Lord. As long as he sold out to Jesus and treat my daughter the way she needs to be treated. I'd much rather have somebody treat my daughter good and love the Lord and on fire than somebody who beating her to death just to have her inter interracial couple or whatever, just to have a white couple. And you say, Brian, I don't like the way you preach because you've got a problem with black people. My God. Let me go over here. Truth. First business, second business meeting that I had at a Baptist church, had a white and black couple move five miles from the church down the road. Here, here was the first business meeting. What are we going to do if they show up to church? And I'm like, see, I was new at this stuff. I didn't know. I was dumb. Still am, really. But he, I, I was silly, and I was sitting there going, uh, let him in. I didn't know no better. See, listen to me. If you're all intellectual and, and you've already you've arrived, you don't need no more of Jesus, you'll make statements like that. But I like people who's just got born again, who's on fire, don't know no better. That'll run the aisle when they feel the Holy Ghost. That'll preach in the name of Jesus. That'll shout in the name of Jesus. They don't come all intellectual at business meetings. First or second business meeting I had, Chris, a black and white couple moved in five miles from the church, and their business meeting was, what are we going to do if they show up for church? See, they're cool. We're sitting there going, okay, bring them on. We, we love it. You know what I'm saying? We love it. But I'm telling you, we're blessed. We don't have to fight the, the religiosity, the, all that stuff out there in the world. We don't have to fight those things. What I'm trying to tell you is a lot of people in the safe zone. And here's what I wrote down. Either you're in the safe zone or you're in the faith zone. Either you're in the safe zone or you're in the faith zone. Hallelujah. See, I just believe that God says you can do it and let's do it. I don't think you got to have a business meeting on growing God's church. I don't think you, I don't, I don't understand this stuff. I really don't. But here's the deal. Either you're in the safe zone and you're comfortable, nothing's changed since you got saved, everything's good, y'all, you're, you're, you know more of the Bible, but are you growing spiritually inwardly than you are outwardly? See, God's worried about your insides growing, not your outsides. Numbers do not impress God. Lights do not impress God. What gets God's attention is somebody who is busted and disgusted and down on their luck and they need help. And then he sees a church that says, I'll take them in just as they are. I'll love them just as they are. And I'll bless them just as they are. And I'll help them get where they can't get themselves. That's what blesses God. So you've got to receive it. Your promises are waiting on you. And I know that's so hard to chew on right now. Some of you think that your prayers are not being answered. And some of you are out there right now and you're looking at me sitting there going, Brian, you just don't understand. Yes, I do. But I'm telling you where my life changed is when I started thanking God for who he is. And I, I quit reminding him what he died for because it's already been paid for. When you start praying, and you start walking in faith, I'm telling you, things will change in your life, as crazy as it sounds. Y'all remember me preaching this series of sermon, Walking in the Fog? Favor of God, walking in the fog, favor of God. It's unstoppable if you're a faith man. I'm telling you, it will come. 
Y'all, real quick, I'm praising you guys come. You don't have to turn there, but I want you to go home and do this as a devotion. Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Jonah just got swallowed by a whale. And some translations, big fish. All I know is this, he got swallowed. I don't care if it was a whale. I don't care if it was a minnow. I don't debate that stuff. He just got swallowed. You know what I'm saying? He was in a mess. He was in a well of a mess. Amen? <laughs> anyway. It's true. I said whale. Listen to me. He was in the, the belly of the whale. And all of a sudden, I started thinking about, what was Jonah thinking about? I know what I probably would have been thinking about. I probably here would have been Rafferty's prayer. Dear Lord, why? I've been a good boy. I kept five of the commandments. Now I'd remind him of the ones I kept. I would be sitting there going, Lord, please, and I know you can do it, but I'd start thinking about I probably deserve <laughs> to be in the belly of the whale. But I want to show you something. I started thinking about, I wonder what Jonah seen. If he, if he based his faith on sin, what would he see? Nothing but darkness. How many of y'all have some dark moments in your life? But I'm telling you, in the dark is when your light will shine the brightest. If it hadn't been for some dark moments in my life, I would not be the pastor that I am today. If it had not been for some dark moments in my life, I would not be where I'm at today. That's hard to say because at the time when I was in the dark, I couldn't see, I couldn't feel, I couldn't do anything, and I was playing the blame game. I started thinking about not only what he could not see, but what he heard. Could you imagine being in the belly of the whale and all you could hear would be the sounds of the belly of the whale? I'm talking about when he growled, it'd be like an earthquake. You know what I'm saying? Bad. I started thinking about what he tastes. He could probably taste some sickness. Some of you have tasted some sickness in your life. God, he's preaching good now. Some of you are in a dark spot. Some of you, you can't see where you're going. You're like in the middle of a tunnel. Some of you guys, all you hear is the noise of the world. You're just as good. And all you're hearing is the sloshing of the world. You can't do it. God's forgot about you. My God. And all of a sudden, you're, you're in a sick moment of your life. You're sick in your bones, and you don't feel like you can go on. I started thinking about what did Jonah smell. He smelled nothing but dead fish, deadness around him. Dead things. Listen to me. If you want to come to life, hang around people that's lively, that brings the best out of your life. They don't shoot you down all the time. They won't sit and tell you the bad reports, but they'll say, blessed be the name. You're a survivor. You're going to make it. God be with you. You're the best. I want people like that in my life. Talk about what he felt. He felt death. I imagine when he was in that belly, that whale feeling around, dead fish. I thought about that this week. Dead things all around him, Bobby. But I love verse 8 of Jonah chapter 2. I love this. Summed it up. I read that and I was like, man, here he is. He's, he's in a dark place. He's hearing the sounds of the world. He's in a sick spot, a death spot, and all he can smell is death, dead things. Verse 8 of Jonah. He said all these things. You can read it later. He said all these things that I see, y'all watch. All these things that I hear, all these things I smell, all these things that I taste, and how I feel. He said, it's all a lying vanity. Oh, let this minister to you. He said, watch this. Just because you can see it, just because you smell stuff around you, death, and you hear the sounds of the world, you're a nobody, and you feel the coldness in a bed, in a dead situation, Oh, we got to have the spirit of Jonah in our life. All those things that I've seen, all these things that I heard, all these things that I felt, it's nothing but a lie because he said these words, the Lord promised me souls and I'm going to get them. I'm going to get them. And I wrote this down in my notes. Jonah prayed until he prayed, prayed so much, he prayed until the fish got sick. 
He started praying and praying. Three days probably felt like a hundred. I started, boy, I got so convicted this week. I said, oh, God, I want the faith like Jonah. And that kind of messed me up because you know what? I will probably get swallowed by a whale. But what God told me, he said, Brian, just because death is around you, just because you're in a dark spot in your life, I'm ministering to you, listen to me, just because you can't feel anything, just because you can smell sickness or smell death, and you're getting ridiculed, he said these words, blessed be the name of God. All these things are vanity, they're lies, because that's not what God said. Oh, it's a fact I'm in the belly of the well. But the truth is, I'm going to pray until the fish gets sick. And when it gets sick, it's going to spit me out. I pray that your belly of the well, will, the well will spit you out. And notice where he spit him at. On land. He spit him on his destiny. Here's some Jesus. You know that? He spit, he prayed, he said, God, all this stuff is a lie. That's not what you said. And God said these words, you're right. I told you to go to Nineveh. I told you to preach. And notice he didn't come back and say, well, they're cutting people's heads off over there, Lord. He said, no, I'm going to get out. And he prayed. And on the third day, y'all know what happens on the third day. What happens? Life. Life, hallelujah, life. And old Jonah was praying, and the fish got sick. He vomited him out. He spit him out on his island of destiny, and 120,000 souls got saved, hallelujah.